Hi, I'm Marge Charmley. Welcome to Buy Cities, a program by, for, and about the Buy Plus community and our friends and allies. If this is the first time you've joined us, we are the longest running show in the history of the world on bisexuality and topics of interest to uh, people that are bi folk and our friends and allies. If you have been with us before, welcome back. We're always loving to uh, have you back on uh, watching us. So my producer, co-producer, and co-host, uh, Dr. Anita Kozan, is not with us tonight. She will return after she gets back from vacation. So uh, she will be here in future shows. But for tonight, um, it'll be me and a very, very special guest. Tonight we have a wonderful uh, health equity advocate and community organizer, Shore Salkas, who is with us tonight to talk about some plans that they have to help our community and also to talk about the work that they do for the state of Minnesota and the community in general. So sure, welcome to Buy Cities. Hi Marge, thanks so much for having me. Oh, you're welcome. And I understand that we're doing you a little bit of a favor tonight by getting you out of toddler bedtime that I hear. That's so true. I yeah. have a two and a half year old and this is a treat compared a to treat. some of the fun times we get to have around 7.30 p.m. Yeah, and then your little toddler is how old now? Two and a half. Two and a half. Yep. Two and a half and a handful. and uh, They're a handful. They have a lot of big feelings. Uh -huh. um, they like to share them with us. So. Oh, they do. Oh, yeah. They're pretty, pretty open about that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. They're, <laughs> yeah, they're it's little, a little very good, good advocates time. like their parents. Yeah, we're trying to nurture emotional expression. Uh -huh. um, and in that process, um, sometimes we're like, oh, that's what this looks like when you're two. So, yeah, yeah. Well, it's yeah. kind of like you want them to be themselves and to express themselves, but mm -hmm. then when they do it toward you, it's yeah. kind of like, I don't know, out in the world, but not here, right? Yeah. yeah <laughs> Abba, yeah. go away. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. what they say to me a lot. Oh. Yeah. And, you know, that's part of it. They get to need, they need their space and they need to deal with their emotions, too. So they're just trying to figure it out. Well, so, so. what I love is that you're teaching your kid emotional mm -hmm. literacy. Yeah, we're, that's what we're trying to do yeah, from yeah, a very yeah. young age, to yeah. identify and to experience emotions um, and then to navigate through them yeah. as well. Yeah. So, yeah, that's exactly what we're trying to do. And that means when they come to see someone like me, I'm a psychologist mm -hmm. in private practice, so then they're, they're much better equipped. Yeah. You know, we don't have to say, this is a feeling, this is how you identify it, mm -hmm. so it's already yeah. in their toolbox. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Hoping to build some of that resiliency early yes. on in their life so yes. that, you know, when they're facing the world, which isn't always friendly to everybody, they can be ready and can look within themselves to find what they need to to deal with those situations, so. Yeah. yeah, and as someone who's done all of what you've done, you know what it's like to have to negotiate places mm -hmm. that aren't always so friendly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, as a queer person and a trans person in this world, like, there's a lot of circumstances that are not friendly, accessible, um, and, you know, that's part of what building resiliency has been for me is finding my voice in those spaces. And I have a feeling that there are some things that as a parent you are uniquely equipped to do to help them in this world because yeah. of your own experiences and having to find your own resilience and dealing mm -hmm. with, you know, yeah. that world out there that isn't always so nice to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's why as parents, my partner and I have been very cognizant about what it means to raise a child in a somewhat gender neutral fashion. Yes. Um, and while it's not something that we feel the need to like push or put pressure on, it's just something that we do and is a part, part of our daily lives. Uh -huh. um, so we all try to use gender neutral pronouns um, in our household uh -huh. and we use gender neutral pronouns for our kid as well. And the thought behind it is, as they develop their identity and explore, they'll figure out what's right for them. Um, and at some day, someday they'll say, hey, Ima and Abba, I want you to call me this, or I want you to use these pronouns, and we'll say, great. Yeah. And, and if they change their mind, great. Yeah, then we'll yeah. figure it out um, as, they, as they learn and grow. So, that is so cool. Yeah. And then I suppose beyond that, if they run into somebody out in the world who says, well, why aren't you a he or a she or then whatever, then you give them the tools for saying because, mm -hmm. right? Oh, absolutely. And it's pretty amazing how early 
kids start to socialize each other uh -huh. about these things. Um, so our kid is two and a half, but we have a number of neighbor children who live on, on our side of the block. And they're always playing and running and having a great time out on, the, on our street. And we've gotten so many questions already from the little kids, like four, five, six-year-olds. All right. Is Zohar a boy or a girl? Um, is Zohar, like it's constant, like is Zohar a boy or a girl? And, you know, I try, it's amazing because I try really hard to talk to those kids and uh -huh. to like start baselining them, basically creating like a bedrock of, well, Zohar's a kid. Yeah, and, a person, a little person, yeah. yeah. And, and really, like, you're asking me about what their genitals are. Uh -huh. um, and the question <laughs> of, are they a boy or a girl? At this point, you know, we're letting Zohar play and explore boy things and girl things uh -huh. and other things. And we want them to, to, to explore that. And most of the kids are like, Whoosh. They're yeah, like, What's yeah. what are you yeah. talking about? And then they just walk away. Yeah, yeah. So... <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, I asked, right? And basically, like yeah, that's yeah. the look on their face. They're like, "What?" Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so I'm doing. Yeah, but we're trying. It's it's amazing how early it starts, both in the neighborhood and in their daycare center as well. Um, kids start really gendering each other very, very early. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, as I mentioned, I work as a psychologist, mm -hmm. and I was at the American Psychological Association mm -hmm. convention a couple weeks ago, mm -hmm. and I went to a uh, uh, workshop and a program on microaggressions yeah. from a national expert and one of the things I learned that I wasn't quite familiar with is that the person said that under the age of two kids are already conditioned around mm -hmm. race and gender Absolutely. like they are already picking up yep. from the world how they're supposed to be yes and so and who they are bingo and who's different than them yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you are offering your kid a different experience is kind of cool. Yeah. We're certainly trying to. And yeah. then there's going to be things that we forget or, you know, our privilege blinds us to. So um, we're going to try our best to navigate those situations as well. Yeah. So, yeah. But being a parent is a wild journey. <laughs> you can prepare all you want, right? Oh, And absolutely. it never prepares you. Yeah. Yeah. You can never be totally prepared. Yeah. For all of the twists and turns in the parenting journey. Yeah. So. And Zohar you've had since day one when Zohar was yeah. born? Or? Yep. Okay. We've had Zohar. Um, my partner carried okay. Zohar. Right. Um, yep. And so we've had them since they were born. Oh, sweet. Yeah. And they're a very sweet little person. Oh. They have really long, curly, blonde hair. And oh. so that's also, you know, a cue around gender for a lot yes. of people. Yes. Yes. Um, and we also offer them a wide variety of clothing options. Uh -huh. And so between the hair and the clothes, people are just often very inquisitive uh -huh. and confused. And I think it's kind of fun to push people's boundaries that way. And one thing kids do is they just ask. Oh, yeah. You know, they're, they don't have the filters yet oh, yeah. or the cognitive development to yeah. do anything different than that. Mm -hmm. Well, it'll be fun maybe to come back in a few years and see how Zohar is doing and yeah. talk more about your parenting. I'm sure we'll be in a very different spot because yeah, yeah. they change so fast between zero and five, uh -huh. which I'm sure you know yeah. um, that it's, it's amazing. Yeah, and we sometimes don't forget that our brains aren't fully developed until we're age 25. So <laughs> even when they're 20 and yeah. maybe go off to wherever they go. Right. Then it gets to be, hmm, okay. Yeah. They still haven't quite developed yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They still got some, some things to work out. Yeah. I mean, I still got some things to work out, yeah, too. Well, so. me too. Yeah, we're all working on it. Yeah, we're a work in progress. Yeah, huh? absolutely. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Well, we talked a little bit before the show about what would you like to share with our audience? I mean, oh. you've got some passions in terms of your community organizing and I some do. dreams that you have. and. Uh, we'll carry on with, with what, what you're doing and what you're hoping to bring to fruition here for our communities. Yeah. Um, so I feel like some of my gifts um, that I've been blessed with in this world is being in community and in spaces with people and being able to like hold spaces and facilitate conversations that are sometimes hard mm -hmm. um, and do trainings and coaching with people. Um, and I'd say that's kind of like some of my some of my gifts in my personal and professional life mm -hmm. um, and so I've been using a lot of that recently to bring people together around conversations to okay. talk about 
if we had a community center, an LGBTQ community center, uh -huh. what does that look like? What's the dream? What's the vision? What do people want? Uh -huh. um, and those conversations have been pretty incredible, like incredibly rich uh -huh. um, and incredibly meaningful. And so it's been really, really wonderful to hear from our communities about, about what they want for a space like that. So you are actually going and having, I don't know if they, you call them focus groups or conversations mm -hmm. about, you know, what would you like to have in a community center and how yeah. do you envision this coming together mm -hmm. or being? Yeah, so yeah, we've been having, we've been calling them community conversations, um, but it's just a lot of people. Old people like me call them focus yeah. groups, maybe, but the community conversations, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but people have just been yeah. very, I mean, we've been trying to keep it casual and down to earth, uh -huh. um, but really just creating spaces uh -huh. for people to dialogue um, and to think through what would a thriving LGBTQ community center look like. Uh -huh. And it's been amazing the things that people have brought to the table. So they've brought like incredible vision around needing healing and health and wellness and well-being spaces and oh, programs. Wow. Um, and so a lot of different ideas within like that realm. Uh -huh. um, there's been a lot of um, energy and um, excitement around arts and cultural spaces as well. Okay. And then I would say the other two main spaces where people have had a lot of energy have been around economic development and leadership development. So things like, how do we make sure that our peers and we're taking care of each other and that we have access to resources like financial literacy um, or how to write a resume or how can we help each other find jobs where we won't be discriminated against and we'll be allowed to thrive. And then how do we like practice and help each other work through our leadership skills. Um, so the things that people have brought to the table have been truly amazing and I'm really excited to see what happens. Well, and to have ongoing, you know, educational sessions or ways to mm -hmm. explore and help each other do that yep. as, a, as a village and a community. Yeah, and really having a really dynamic intergenerational space has also mm -hmm. come up quite a bit um, and a space that really honors those most impacted by oppression mm -hmm. and systemic oppression and systemic racism. So really honoring the fact that LGBTQ folks of color and indigenous folks often face greater oppression um, and marginalization. Yes. And that folks living with disabilities often face f increased barriers and systemic yep. oppression as well. And how do we create a space that honors and holds the fact that um, those communities need to be at the center of decision making and as well as at the center of developing programs and being mindful of that as well. So it's been pretty awesome. Yeah, to, to have a space that's inclusive and open to all. Because mm -hmm. I think historically people of color haven't always felt safe in queer yeah. spaces. So yep. we have a lot of work to continue doing. We do. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's why it's one of our intentions to really center the voices of LGBTQ folks of color um, and indigenous people mm -hmm. so that they're kind of at the center mm -hmm. and knowing that then everything we build out from there, there will be a sense of universal access for everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say universal access, really what I mean is that if we're designing something with groups of people that face larger or the, like the deepest systemic barriers, uh -huh. then it should be accessible then to everyone else as well. Well, that's because, a good way to do it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah and so that's yeah. the idea of universal access. Um, uh -huh. And that being said, that's really complicated and we have to be really mindful of mm -hmm. what that means for our communities because our communities are incredibly diverse. So, yeah. yeah. So how far along this uh, vision or this mm -hmm. project are, are you? That's a great question. So we've had a lot of conversations. We launched a brand at Pride, right. a, a brand, I should say, a campaign at uh -huh. Pride, um, and it's called Our Space. Okay. Um, and the idea is that we're co-creating our space together. Okay. Um, and so we're going to continue having conversations with communities this fall. Um, we're going to. We've been asked to do some identity-specific conversations. So we'll be doing. Um, hopefully one around disability, the intersection of disability and LGBTQ communities, um, specifically one for black, indigenous, and folks of color, um, doing one for trans folks, and then 
hopefully doing one at the Because Conference yes. for Buy Plus folks. Um, so really trying to tap different pockets of our communities uh -huh. um, and really have intentional conversations with those pockets of our communities. So as you develop and create our space, how do you imagine implementing this? You know, how, where mm -hmm. do you get the money, for example? Or, you those know, are great questions. How, um, how does that ha come to fruition? Yeah, so in developing, so our space is, the idea of it is to have a campaign to both bring people into, the, into this process, okay. um, whether it's via these conversations or via joining a board of directors okay. or an advisory council. So right now, we're really in the space of building out infrastructure. Okay. Um, and part of that will be recruiting for a board of directors. Okay. So if you want to apply, All our right. applications are going to be live really soon on our website, which is rspacemn.com. Um, All right, rspacemn.com. Yeah. Yep, so the, right. the applications will be live um, by September 1st. 2019. 2019, yeah, this okay. year, couple yeah. in like a week and yeah, a half yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, for our board of directors. And then we'll also be recruiting for advisory council members. Um, and the way we're understanding it is that board of directors are the folks who are going to continue to help build the infrastructure, work on fundraising, look at space. Um, and other folks are encouraged to support that work if they're interested mm -hmm. in it. Um, and then our advisory councils, we're envisioning those groups kind of aligning with those four areas that I talked about, okay. health and well-being, arts and culture, economic development, and leadership development, and really helping us bring the programming to life. Okay. And so we're ho hoping to bring folks who have real passion about those things into those spaces to be like, yeah, we want to have a calendar of fitness events, and we're going to start putting that together and hosting it in this, in this temporary space or we really want to develop, you know, some art classes or a gallery space that will temporarily showcase art or something like that. So we're lo really looking for people who have passion about those uh -huh. things and really want to bring it to life. You know, it just popped into my head to have like a little place to have tea or coffee mm -hmm. or something where people gather. Well, and of course, you know, that that's another wrinkle like, of stuff. It's but. like you can read, like read my mind or the oh, notes all right. from all the community conversations. Uh -huh. Have you read them? I have not. No. Just, I've read your mind. No, I, no I'm, I'm just, just teasing. Playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's actually a really another component of what we're hoping to do uh -huh. is make this really sustainable uh -huh. and um, create a really... Um, what's the word I'm looking for, intentional business model, where there's pieces of the business model that sustain the community center. So we've gotten a lot of ideas about what types of social entrepreneurship or what types of businesses to open uh -huh. alongside the community center. So a cafe oh, okay. is one of them. All right. Folks really want a place to gather and eat. Um, I don't know if you remember Cafe Southside. Okay, sure. Yeah, so uh -huh. Cafe Southside was this amazing spot um, in South Minneapolis, and there was, and it was like a queer, trans, POC owned business, uh -huh. um, actually owned by Roxanne Anderson, who's okay. also very involved in spearheading this project. Um, and they owned this cafe, and it was always full of people who just wanted to be in community together. And so, Having a cafe or some or a small restaurant um, is something that we're hoping to in, have as a part of the community center. Having a gallery space or a co-working space um, are also things that we've been talking about. Um, potentially a small gym. So we're talking about like no small. This is no small beastie. No, this is good to have grand dreams. We have big dreams. That's good. Yeah. And so I would say when you open a little cafe, have like a little buy cookie or something, you know, with our trans cookie. Oh, know? absolutely. Yeah, so we We're going to have all the have flag our, cookies. Our, our little flavors, yeah. 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 Yeah, that'd be great. That's yeah. a good idea. Yeah. I love that. Well, this is exciting. Are you getting any pushback from any of the established uh, queer organizations? You know, we, we don't have to name names, but, yeah. you know, there are a few that have been around a while. Mm -hmm. And are they saying, well, you know, you're taking over my space or, you know, blah, blah, blah? That's a great question. Um, no. We don't, okay. We're not getting any pushback okay. um, from any of the established agencies that are out sure. there. In fact, we've been working really hard to partner with them. Okay. Um, a few months ago, we brought together a number of leadership from you know organizations that serve LGBTQ people in the metro area and really kind of presented the R Space idea to them mm -hmm. and the campaign to them and said, we like it's really important for you all to be a part of this because we 
are going to be growing a space, growing this community. And, you know, at the end of the day, something that we've heard is people want their resources to be more centralized. Yeah. And so if this happens and when this happens, can we count on you to have your resources here or maybe even have a satellite office at the community center? Yeah. And most of the folks that were in the room, if not all of them, said, absolutely, yes. Like, you have our blessing. We have your back. Absolutely, we want to be, we want to see this happen too. So I'm not finding that there's a lot of, like, weird or negative feelings about it at all. Good. So that's great. Well, once upon a time, we actually had a little brick and mortar by community space. Really? And it's hard to sustain. It was over yeah. on Lake Street. Mm -hmm. And then it's kind of like, well, how do we keep it going? And how do we keep the funds coming? How do we pay the mm -hmm. rent? Yep. So it was there for, I don't know how many years, but mm -hmm. now it's gone. Yeah. So. Which has happened in the Twin Cities before. Yeah. You know, District 202. Oh, yeah. Was a youth LGBT center. Um, the exchange over at 3405 Chicago okay. was a space, um, you know, that had Trans a space and yeah. Yeah, shots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where the shot clinic, clinic was. Absolutely. Was, yeah. Yep. Um, and so there have been all these spaces, and for many different reasons, reasons including sustainability, I think that they've shut down um, over the years, and that's why we're trying to be planful and mindful of how do we make a business model that's thinking about that. Yes. Yes. So. Well, yeah. cafe and breaking bread and all mm -hmm. that kind of. Oh, yeah, Breaking Bread has a, such a cool model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, is there anything else that you wanted to mention about uh, our space? Because I'm also interested, mm -hmm. you have some special ec expertise as a health equity person at the state yes. of Minnesota. And so you're familiar with the disparities in the queer community. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you're ready to segue over there, we'd love to hear just, you know, sure. some of what you're noticing and some of the special needs that we have in our community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's Have do it. it. All right. Yeah. So my role um, at the state health department is um, I work on health equity. So at the Center for Health Equity, um, and really within that role, what I do is I try to support people in figuring out like how do you do that work. Okay. And I coach them and train them and facilitate a lot of trainings. Um, but then I also have been really cognizant of the fact that we all need to do better on supporting queer and trans communities um, and LGBTQ communities um, because there's huge disparities in our communities. So we actually conducted um, a community conversation about LGBT health okay. um, last fall, I think okay. last November. And that was a really wonderful conversation where we had folks divide into tables um, and they could choose to write in their own topic, but they were different LGBT health topics. So uh -huh. we had, you know, bisexual health, lesbian health, trans health, um, folks of color at the intersection of LGBTQ, um, elder folks, mm -hmm. you know, we had a number of different options and then some people self-selected um, into other spaces as well. And it was amazing because I think that part of Part of what surprised me and didn't surprise me is that uh -huh. people have been saying the same things for years and years and mm -hmm. years. So I've been having this conversation, whether it's in this official capacity or via my back to my work when I was in graduate school. Wow. Um, and people are really saying very similar things now as they were 10 years ago. Um, and that is that we need access to health care. We need providers who know how to treat us as whole people. Mm -hmm. um, and that don't tokenize us or try to learn from us or refuse treatment because of our LGBTQ plus identities. Mm -hmm. um, we need our communities to be respected. And when we're at the intersection of multiple identities, so for example, if we're you know, a black person who identifies as trans, mm -hmm. like we need our providers and lots of different service providers to understand that intersection right. as well. Um, and that that's unique and that the barriers that people face at different intersections are really unique. Um, we heard that folks want to be leaders um, mm -hmm. in their community and that there's a lot of barriers to that um, that are really the social determinant barriers. So access to transportation and housing, um, access to bathrooms in their 
workplace or in service provider spaces. So we heard a lot of the same things that we've been hearing for many, many years. Um, and also that some of those things are getting better. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some of the highlights, I think, from that conversation. Some of the things that have uh, always broken my heart as a bi woman is just to, to look at some of those demographics and statistics and see, you know, the number of bi people, a percentage in, in poverty. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Which, you know, we don't think about in America, mm -hmm. but, you know, the, the disparities there, uh, some of the mental health things going on with bi women and yep. suicidal thoughts. And, and, you know, to continue to remind mm -hmm. the public at large that this isn't because part of our identity, there's something wrong with it. Absolutely. It's minority stress. It's that the culture yes. out there and the marginalization that we face brings another level mm -hmm. of stress that yes. the average person doesn't have to negotiate. Yes. And that is bad for mental health and health mm -hmm. and substance health and yes. chemical health. So, And we actually, we heard a lot about that. Uh -huh. Some people have the language to name that explicitly. Yes. Yes. And you know, some people just say like, it's really stressful to go to the doctor or it's really stressful to go to work and not have a place to go to the bathroom. Yeah. You know, and like, we'll just say that and say like, that means that I'm just really stressed out all day. Yeah, and, yeah. And you know what that, that essentially means exactly what you're saying is this minority stress um, is causing people to be anxious and have like anxiety and symptoms related to that um, and maybe not take care of themselves the way that they wish that they could yeah. in different spaces or even at home. So we heard lots about that as well and that ultimately what minority stress does is it causes people to, you know, figure out like how do I either mitigate this and make it feel better or what do I need to do to make myself feel better um, and what we heard from folks is that there's still a lot of folks who are using drugs tobacco and alcohol in those scenarios right to, um, to self-soothe yeah and so that's definitely still happening in our communities um, and I think is also changing because there's a lot of folks who are doing a lot of work around tobacco control and having spaces that are alcohol-free alcohol or sober spaces. Um, so the landscape is just changing around all of that as well, So, which is great to hear. So that's what's heartening. You wouldn't believe this, Shore, but we're at the end of our time. What? <laughs> I know. Already? I know. We're getting the wrap over here. <laughs> so Shore Salkas, thank you so much thank for being you. on By Cities. And please, you know, be in touch with me as we continue Absolutely. to move on and you develop those dreams because it's so important yes. for us to have community. Yes. So thank, thank you, you so for much the for work you me. do. Good luck when you go home and, and uh, hopefully the toddler's in bed. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, would you join us in our signature goodbye? Yes, absolutely. Bye for now. Bye for now. <laughs>